So without further ado, I would like to bring on today's speaker, Rick Habercate from the Indian Health Service. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation from FDA, uh, Office of Minority Health, and I very much uh, am encouraged and excited that we have a number of people online that are looking forward to learning more about ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for America, and how that impacts Indian Health Service specifically, and then our tribes and urban programs throughout the country. And we lovingly call them Indian country. Now there's no such land or geographic, geographic like barriers or boundaries that you can define as Indian country, but suffice it to say, it covers all 50 states and some of our territories. So when I say Indian country, um, you probably won't find that definition on the map, but I appreciate the fact that you're here to learn about HIV and Indian country. Today, I hope to talk about um, the specific goals of ending the HIV epidemic. I hope you can remember the four key strategies of the plan. And then finally, I hope you can remember and be able to describe what we mean when we say treatment as prevention or TASP. And along the way, I hope you pick up some tidbits about how HIV is affecting Indian country and what we're doing about it with Indian Health Service. All of our funds for all the programs that are due through the Indian Health Service come from the Minority HIV AIDS Fund. As of now, IHS does not receive any of the Ending the HIV Epidemic Funds, but we give gratitude and we're always very thankful to the folks at the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy, part of the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, for the competitive funds that we get through the Minority HIV AIDS Fund. So all the activities you'll see me present today are funded 100% uh, through the Minority HIV AIDS Fund. Let's start off a little bit of talking about what HIV looks like in Indian country. So I, brief, I based this update on the latest available HIV statistics for American Indians and Alaska Natives. I'm using data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that they've reported through December 2019. And that data includes, but it's not limited to data from the Indian Health Service. A word of caution as I begin, as shown in multiple studies and due to missing or misclassified racial data on various health conditions, national disease surveillance data may undercount American Indian and Alaska Native people. And the IHS Division of Epidemiology and the CDC are updating HIV data using more recent internal IHS data. As you probably know, HIV is a reportable disease as part of the CDC's National Notifiable Disease and Surveillance System. And like all health system providers, the IHS facilities report notifiable diseases to their respective state health authorities, which transmit the data to CDC. So then let's look at the most recently available data for American Indians and Alaska Natives specific to HIV. And the data comes from the individual states which report their diagnosis of HIV to the CDC through December 2019. Once the states transmit their HIV data to the CDC's National Center for HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, STD, and TB prevention collects, cleans, and analyzes the data and makes it available to the general public. All the data you'll see here can be found on cdc.gov. The figure on the screen is taken directly from the national CDC report and it shows trends of new HIV diagnoses by race and ethnicity. And this graph you see is not fully inclusive of all races in the US. For this slide, I've zoomed into a smaller chart of racial groups with lower rates of new diagnoses. And that explains why it might appear a bit, uh, you know, have some big peaks and valleys. Uh, and it doesn't include all the racial groups. To get the full data set, um, please go to cdc.gov and look for uh, HIV surveillance. And this came, comes from volume 31. Remarkably in this report, we see that the death rate among American Indian and Alaska Native people living with HIV in 2018 is 30% lower than it was in 2014. The American Indian Alaska Native death rate has been lower than the white rate for the past two reporting years. 
And while we can't infer any causation on a national scale, we do know that our larger IHS operated HIV treatment programs like the Phoenix and Gallup Indian Medical Centers show outstanding HIV testing, linkage to care, and viral suppression outcomes among their HIV patients. And because our smaller IHS, tribal, and urban Indian health clinics often refer their HIV patients to specialty clinics outside of the Indian health system for treatment, we often lose track of their cascade of care. So please know that this does not include every single person who claims or identifies with American Indian Alaska Native race. These are specifically those folks who um, get into the Indian health system and their data gets transferred to the CDC or someone from a state or a county or a private clinic records their race as American Indian or Alaska Native. Now let's look at the HIV transmission mechanism among American Indian Alaska Native people in 2018. The CDC data shows that the majority or 84% of the reported HIV diagnosis in American Indian Alaska Native people were among men. And most of the documented HIV transmission among these men was from male to male sexual contact, which accounted for 75% of new diagnoses. The second most common transmission route for men is injection drugs combined with male to male sexual contact, accounting for 15% of new diagnoses. 5% from injection drug use and the remaining 5% was from heterosexual contact. American Indian and Alaska Native women have rates lower than that of our American Indian men, but of those who are living with HIV, 57% of our women were infected through heterosexual contact and 43 through injection drug use. Other statistics include recently published CDC report on American Indian Alaska Native adults in HIV care. And this national monitoring project uses in-person and phone interviews that CDC conducts with persons in HIV care. The project seeks to understand better and document the experiences and needs of persons in HIV care. And this analysis concentrated on patients who self-reported as American Indian or Alaska Native. These data showed robust patient adherence levels and some room for improvement on viral suppression, which as we know is crucial, a crucial indicator for both patient health and preventing HIV transmission. The report showed that 86% of American Indian and Alaska Native adult patients on antiretroviral therapy were adhering to their care plan. 64% of them achieved sustained viral suppression. And in the tw past 12 months before the study, 76% of American Indian and Alaska Native adult patients achieve viral suppression as of their most recent viral load test. And this brings me to that point of, of one of our objectives today was to talk about treatment as prevention. We know that if we get people in for HIV testing and screening, and for those who are positive, if we get them into adequate care very quickly, and get them on the right medications and keep them on the right kinds of medications, we can get their viral load down to an undetectable level. And if we do that, they're virtually incapable of transmitting the virus to others. So we treat them and then hand in hand comes the prevention side, treatment as prevention. We need to screen people, we need to get them into care, we need to get them on medications, keep them there, keep them there follow them through their care, uh, perhaps through patient navigation, other sorts of reminders. If we do that, we can get them to that all important undetectable viral load and therefore they are unable to transmit the virus. In another recent MMWR report that used in-person and phone interviews to understand better and document persons' experiences and needs in HIV care, CDC showed that the effects of underlying challenges faced by our native people living with HIV are troubling. Approximately 50% are affected by poverty and 20% by substance use. 
From our healthcare providers in Indian country, we hear internally that substance use disorders pose one of the main barriers to treatment, adherence, and HIV treatment programs. Substance use disorders are overrepresented in rural and poor areas, and Indian country is no exception. Also, poverty can create barriers to consistent care, such as lack of transportation or unstable housing. The well-documented under-resourcing of IHS relative to other national health systems can mean there is limited access to behavioral health or recovery programs. IHS is making innovations in healthcare during COVID-19, such as telehealth. Still, our communities, are, our communities often do not have reliable internet or cell phone data coverage, so the digital divide has a more significant impact than ever before. Most troubling is the high proportion of patients who reported stigma. Stigma can have severe effects on treatment-seeking behavior, mental health, and the ultimate well-being and outcome of our Native people living with HIV. And to reduce stigma, those of us working with Native communities must continue our efforts to promote a better understanding of HIV and the fact that we can treat effectively and manage HIV as a chronic disease. Now to some of the highlights of what the ending the HIV epidemic is all about. Quoted, we have a once in a generation opportunity to end the HIV epidemic in the United States, and now is that time. 700,000 American Indian, Americans, not American Indians, American lives have been lost to HIV since 1981. And we estimate about a million are currently living with HIV in the US. For the last decade or so, we've been seeing 40,000 new diagnoses each year, and we are having trouble moving that. So that's why ending the HIV epidemic is so important. We need to move that needle down and the US government spends about $20 billion annually for HIV prevention and care. There's always that risk of an HIV resurgence. So now definitely is the time to concentrate on ending the HIV epidemic, putting our resources, putting our minds, putting our good intentions, putting our hard efforts into this program. Mentioned earlier, the goals of the plan are to buy reduce by 75% the number of new HIV infections in five years, and in 10 years to reduce new HIV diagnosis by 90%. We have the right tools, we have the right data. We're not waiting for any miracles, we're not waiting for any magic cures, we're not waiting for any more science. We would welcome it, don't get me wrong, but right now we have the ability to do this. We also have the right leadership. The federal HHS agencies involved in ending the HIV epidemic include the CDC, HRSA, IHS, NIH, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, and SAMHSA. All are on board, all work diligently to do this. We meet constantly, our leaders meet, uh, those who are behind the scenes meet. Uh, we work very hard on making sure that this is one seamless cross-government effort. The focus on ending the HIV epidemic is in those areas of the country where the majority of the infections are taking place. Uh, and that boils down to just about 50 jurisdictions in the country. You see the dots there, most of those are urban centers, but then the planners of EHA also were very adamant that we focus on those rural areas in America where the rates of HIV were as high, if not higher, than some of the urban locations. Yes, the numbers were smaller, but the overall rates per 100,000 were alarming. So to be inclusive as possible in the US, those urban areas with the highest rates and those rural areas with the higher rates were specifically included in the geographic focus areas. And when you consider Indian country, if you overlaid this map with a map of where our tribal communities are, most all of those urban areas would ha do have high numbers per capita of American Indians. We have high uh, per cap numbers in places like New York, Detroit, Chicago, Houston, LA, San Francisco. Um, and then we also, in those rural areas, have a lot of folks living in Oklahoma, 
Alabama, Mississippi. So we are definitely included in this map. The key strategies of the map, four key strategies to diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond. Diagnose all people with HIV as early as possible. Treat, 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 treat people with HIV rapidly and effectively to reach that sustained viral suppression. Prevent new transmissions by using interventions like PrEP, not forgetting our tried and true things like condoms and education, but PrEP. We've got a great tool in PrEP. We need to make sure people know about pre-exposure prophylaxis. And then learn about the Ready, Set, PrEP program. That wasn't one of my objectives today, but I gotta throw it in there. Check out the Ready, Set, PrEP program, a program instituted through the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health to get free PrEP medication to those who do not have prescription drug coverage. A great program. We need people to sign up for that. And then respond. Respond quickly to potential HIV outbreaks to get needed prevention and treatment services to people who need them. So please remember, diagnose, treat, prevent, respond. So there are 48 counties. I said somewhere around 50, but I couldn't remember that exact number. So there's 48 counties, including, uh, in addition to San Juan, and then seven states with substantial rural HIV burden. I just wanted to, to remind you again where this effort, and this is just phase one, folks. There'll be continuing phases of this program as it matures. But uh, in the early stages, there's, this is the, these are the phase one geographic focus areas. Now we have step by step. We can't make it all happen at one time. So the Indian Health Service is working closely with HHS and our other partners to implement these steps of EHE. So by 2021, we want to reduce by 15% the number of new infections. So we're busy trying to track that. Do we have the systems set up? Do we have the data tracking? Do we have uh, reporting going in? Do we have analysis coming out? How are we doing with getting that reduction by 15% by 2021? And increasing by 15% the linkage to HIV medical care, getting people who are newly diagnosed into care making sure we're tracking them, documenting that we got them into care. And then we also wanna increase by 15% the number of persons with indications for PrEP who are prescribed PrEP. Admiral Gerard says that we need to get to 60, between 50 and 60% for the number of persons with indications for PrEP who are then prescribed PrEP. So. Find out about PrEP. Find out about the Ready, Set, PrEP program. Find out how you get your people on patient assistance program if their insurance doesn't cover PrEP and if they don't qualify for Ready, Set, PrEP. But we need to get 50 to 60% of our folks who have indications for PrEP and get them on PrEP. I went over this a little bit ago, so I'm in, in the essence of, uh, to save a little bit of time, I'll move on. But we have a very strategic approach and we are working hard to get the communication out in webinars such as this to get the our partners um, those who don't often work in the field of hiv but work in maybe in other fields like sti sexual transmitted infections uh, hepatitis c substance use disorders uh, we need to inform everyone about our strategic approach to this program Briefly, um, we're looking at what some of the statistics show now. Uh, from 2017, there were approximately 37,000 new HIV infections. And we, so you can see what our target would be by a 15% reduction in 2021. Uh, related, the persons diagnosed and linked to care. In 2017, about 77.8 of all folks diagnosed were then quickly linked to care within one month of their diagnosis. The 2021 goal is 80.4%. That's a 15% increase. And for PrEP coverage in 2017, about 12.6% of those with PrEP indications were actually on PrEP. And by next year, we need to increase that to 18.2. And IHS is busy working with CDC and other partners to figure out how we measure that. What is our denominator? How do we find that out? Um, it's difficult, as you can imagine, in some of our data. I mean, we really know that um, most of our new diagnoses in Indian country are coming from men who have sex with men, but how do you know that uh, when you're doing a, 
a medical intake or someone comes into a, an ER where we might be able to prescribe PrEP. Those are situations where it's difficult to know who should be on PrEP. Uh, it takes some, takes some work, it takes some time, it takes education in our communities. Uh, we're instituting an effort in IHS and our federal facilities to start asking about sexual orientation and gender identity so we can use that information to provide the best possible care for all of our patients. So that's something else that maybe we can talk about in a few months. I can come back and do a webinar on our successes with instituting voluntarily, voluntary uh, offering of information from the patient about their sexual orientation and gender identity. Let me tell you a little bit about what IHS is doing. And for the past few years, we've been working side by side with our federal partners to end the HIV epidemic. But like I said, we're not receiving EHE dollars we are getting, however, minority HIV AIDS funds, which help us prepare for the eventual inclusion in the EHE funding stream. But one of our big things that we started last year was a pilot project with the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. And their objectives are to implement a public education campaign centering on HIV care and HIV prevention, and then educate their providers on the need to have discussions about the sexual health of the patients both fitting very well into the objectives of the EHE. Further, they want to identify and link to care persons who currently access Cherokee Nation Health Services and are at high risk for contracting HIV and establish a robust PrEP program within Cherokee Nation Health Services. Like a lot of things in the last year, their efforts have been a little slowed down because of COVID you can imagine that our tribal, as well as our IHS and urban clinics are heavily burdened by COVID right now. And we were understaffed in a lot of our areas to begin with. So when we take a lot of our docs and get them focused on COVID, understandably, they can't put their full attention to fulfilling these objectives. So we've asked for a, a year long extension in this pilot project and HHS granted that to us. So. We're still working on the efforts, just not going as quickly as we'd hoped, but a lot of good things are happening. Another big key to our success is using our tribal epidemiology centers. Uh, there are 12 of them around the country. I'll show you a map in a few minutes of where they're located, but we offered with funds from the Minority HIV AIDS Fund, um, some grant money to our existing tribal epi centers in two different groups depending on their jurisdictions. And uh, total funding was approximately 2.4 million. So this was published uh, in 2019. Nine of our tribal epicenters applied for and were awarded funds, and we were able to give them a second year of funding. And they're working on a variety of projects to bring more awareness about HIV, about PrEP, about how to respond to outbreaks, about preparing communities to deal with stigma, um, getting people ready to track their own data, to make their own reports. It's all about bringing the power to the people. So we're, this is not a top-down agency. It really relies on the work that's happening at the grassroots level. And that's what our tribal epicenters do. They work with their tribal constituents, tribal epicenters, keyword tribal. They're not governed by, ruled by, supervised by the Indian Health Service. They really are a tribal organization. They work with the tribal consortium in their, in their own areas. There you see the, the layout of where the tribal epicenters are located. Uh, the jurisdictions aren't lined out there, but uh, we cover just about every state in the country with our tribal epidemiology centers. I think probably about 37 states are included. Uh, one of the other major things we did with some of the funding to prepare our communities for EHE was to conduct listening sessions. And we funded the National Indian Health Board uh, to do tribal listening sessions, and then the National Council of Urban Indian Health to conduct HIV and hepatitis C listening sessions. I have the reports, uh, excellent information. We're getting ready to figure out how do we inform our IHS leadership and HHS and, and maybe do some uh, blogs or writings for the general population to discover the great things we discovered through these listening sessions, how tribes are, are letting us know what, what's missing in HIV care and treatment uh, prevention, uh, what, what's working well, who are the key players, who are the key segments of society, do we need to work more with 
uh, women? Do we need to be, be working more with elders? Uh, so we're, we're, we've learned a lot, and that helps influence then how we move forward and implement special programs. A quick little summary of the things that we've been doing. Uh, one of the tribal centers, uh, tribal epicenters in the Albuquerque area developed a resource guide for the 27 communities in New Mexico. Uh, they also developed a fact sheet featuring indicators on injection drug use and sexual behaviors in youth. Uh, the Alaska Native Epidemiology Center executed a global network of people living with HIV stigma survey. So they're in the process of uh, figuring out what kinds of stigma exist, who's feeling the stigma, where it might be coming from, and then methods to address that stigma. The Urban Indian Health Institute's Tribal Epicenter created a survey on HIV and PrEP knowledge, attitudes and beliefs at 41 of their urban Indian health organizations. And those are all around the country. So we hope to learn more about that in the coming weeks. And then the National Indian Health Board created two amazing toolkits, which I've been really pleased with. They've included me all, all along the way in doing some of the edits and technical advising. But one is they're gonna help tribal communities create HIV related social media. I'm not a social media guru by any means, but I'm so fascinated by how people use it, what they know about it, uh, the science behind it, the art of developing social media, so that's what that toolkit is intended to do. And then also we uh, there have created a prep for healthcare providers working in Indian communities. Uh, in addition to that, what the National Indian Health Board did, the Indian Health Service with our partners at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board uh, created a prep navigator online course. It's a free course, uh, it, you do it online in about four sessions uh, it's knowledge and background that someone would need to be a PrEP navigator, that person who could be the go-between from the clinical side to the client side. What does the client need? What might the clinic not know about? Um, how, how well is the client doing with some of the potential side effects? How does the client get to set up their appointments for the three-month labs? All those things that make for a really uh, strong um, relationship between the client and our clinic. Uh, how do they get their prescriptions? Do we mail them? All those things come into play. So go to IHS.gov and just search PrEP Navigator. You'll find that course, IHS.gov and search PrEP Navigator. It's free. Uh, you register for it. If, if needed, you can get CMEs and CEUs. Some of the other projects that IHS is doing around the country, uh, we are getting ready to unroll and HIV primary care and treatment recommendations for adults. Those should be coming out uh, within days. I have to make it uh, a big show of it for World AIDS Day, but it's really specific for those providers working within Indian Health Service facilities, uh, but anybody can copy it. So if anyone's listening who's from a tribal 638 funded or uh, operated program or an urban Indian health clinic, please, um, Soon, you'll be able to go to IHS.gov and just grab those treatment guidelines and, and implement them for your own clinics. Uh, we're always looking for ways to help the area offices and service units achieve their goals with HIV and hepatitis C. So, um, and like everybody does, we always want data, right? Collect the data, show us your data. What are you doing? What are your numbers? But how often does it get back to those people who are working at, on the ground level uh, in HIV and hepatitis C. So we created these report cards this year. So every um, service unit, every area office got a very specific report card to show how their screening is uh, compared to the rest of Indian country, compared to the rest of the country, and then um, some of the treatment and care statistics. It's not publicly available data. It's only specific for those service units in those IHS areas, but it's something that we took the step to do because uh, I know what it's like to be reporting, 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 but whatever comes of that data. So finally, we were able to get our report cards back to our folks uh, doing the ground on the work. Uh, I talked about the prep navigator training. And then um, the Urban Indian Health Institute released a short film called Positively Native. So if you go to their website, Urban Indian Health Institute, uh, find Positively Native, great video. And then the Oklahoma area tribal epidemiology center 
we funded um, them in coordination with the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board to launch a campaign to train providers to increase access to train providers and increase access to PrEP prescribers. So uh, about 50 providers altogether representing 34 different tribes and tribal facilities are, are um, positively impacted by that project. Another great thing that's happening in Cherokee Nation is a text messaging system that will deliver HIV self-testing kits to doorsteps throughout Indian Country. They've set up a special text number uh, and right now we're piloting just in the Oklahoma area, but uh, within a few months, I think we'll be able to start expanding that out to the rest of the country so people can get self-test kits mailed right to their home uh, just by sending a simple text in. I encourage you to check out the Northwest Portland Area and Health Board's Healthy Native Youth Collaborative and especially their newly launched Talking is Power campaign. That's part of our efforts to end the HIV epidemic. And then the Northwest Tribal Epicenter is using a race corrected HIV data from Washington Department of Health to better understand HIV disease burden within the Northwest tribal communities. Uh, oftentimes we're a little fuzzy, I think, in how HIV is really affecting our local population. So that's a really great effort that their Tribal Epicenter is doing. Again, I think to bring that power of data to the local level. And then I think a really exciting thing that Northwest Portland's doing with us is to um, do a trans and gender affirming care echo. We're in the second cohort. Uh, it's designed for providers uh, and it's, we have faculty like other echoes do. If you're not familiar with Project Echo, I really encourage you to learn more about Project Echo and how the telemedicine uh, is done through biweekly or monthly phone calls to help providers teach other providers how to offer optimal care. That's been greatly successful with our efforts to eliminate hepatitis C and HIV, to increase PrEP, and now to offer trans and gender affirming care throughout Indian Country. As you might imagine, COVID is having an impact on HIV and our antiretroviral programs around Indian Country. But we wanted to get firsthand knowledge of how it's really affecting. So we interviewed our frontline HIV clinical leadership because we rely on their point of view to determine the true impact. And we know these clinicians were extremely busy and they're called into direct COVID-19 care. So in reaching in to them directly, we kept it to essentials with just three questions and a comment box. We conducted the first survey in early May and then we repeated it in early August. And we got a really fairly short report with great insights into what's going on in the field. So um, we asked them three questions. For, we asked just the clinical leads of our major antiretroviral therapy programs in IHS. And specifically those facilities who do receive some of those minority HIV AIDS funds for their support. In total, we interviewed seven sites and four of them were within the Navajo Nation. And um, those surveys included sites in Anchorage, Alaska, Tahlequah, Oklahoma, Phoenix, Chinle, and Tuba City, Arizona, and Gallup and Shiprock, New Mexico. And the overall impression is that the impact of COVID has been moderate on our HIV programs. Folks were able to immediately switch to telemedicine and by August, most sites had a working model of which patients could and should come in for in-person visits. A lot of our providers signal that the quality of care is suffering and that the effects might not be seen yet, but they will manifest in time. Some of our home visit programs were canceled or these resources are needed for COVID-19 response. So uh, it definitely is affecting what's happening in our service areas. Um, we do know that a lack of in-person visits means that some clinical manifestations will go undetected. That could be things like, you know, binding, things like Kaposi sarcoma. But social isolation and substance use disorders are the most challenging for our patients. Our HIV medical team is having to work more in silos than ever before, and at least one site has reported new HIV patients since COVID-19 in part due to HIV patients 
relocating back to the reservation. And that could be part of the answer, although it's not clear if this was for economic or health or other reasons. And one facility noted that resources going towards COVID-19 had actually improved ART adherence. So here's a positive thing about COVID. It actually improved antiretroviral therapy adherence as a proportion of their HIV patient cohort were homeless, but emergency housing was made available as part of the COVID-19 response. We were able to stabilize their housing situation and help improve their adherence to their medication regime. regime. Uh, PrEP services definitely are struggling to adapt. The intake and quarterly laboratory visits require in-person visits. If you're on PrEP, you're required to have these laboratory visits every three months. Um, and sometimes that makes things a little more complicated. And our health facilities have to adjust to how they work through that when they're often thinking, okay, only essential in-person visits to our clinics and our labs. We're working around that. The demand on laboratory resources for COVID support is extremely high. And we're in discussions with our field on when and how to best reapproach scaling up our PrEP services. And that's the end of my presentation. So um, we're gonna be doing a q and I think soon, but I'll turn this back over to our folks at FDA to do our knowledge check. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. That was a wonderful and very informative presentation. For our audience, we are now going to go into the knowledge check for those who are seeking continuing education credit in just a moment, a poll will pop onto your screen with three questions, and I will give you about two minutes to answer those questions. And I think most of you have had an opportunity to answer, but we're gonna keep it open just another minute. In the meantime, you can also enter any questions that you have for our lecturer into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions about the content he delivered today or about IHS or the task program or prep related questions, feel free to ask in the Q&A box. And just to make sure we are covered, I will read the questions one last time. Question one, AIA in women show a rate of HIV diagnosis that is three times the rate of white women, true or false. The primary goal of the ending the HIV epidemic plan is to reduce the new HIV infections by at least what percentage in 10 years? at least 50, at least 30, at least 90. Select one of those three choices. In question three, the four key strategies of the ending the HIV epidemic plan are diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond. True or false? Pick one of those two options, please. And we will begin our Q&A discussion. One of our first questions is, what are some of the barriers for PrEP therapy? Do they vary among the different tribes or geographic areas? And that is a question for Mr. Habercate. Sure, thank you. Um, I think primarily some of the barriers are not knowing about it. So if someone doesn't even know what PrEP is or know how to ask about it, there's no way they're going to ever get on PrEP. So we're working hard to inform not just our providers about PrEP. And anecdotally, you know, a few years ago, I did a little survey and more than half of our providers had not even heard about PrEP. It's becoming more popular, it's in the news, it's talked about a lot, especially on this uh, trajectory towards ending the HIV epidemic. But we're also working really hard in our communities to let those folks who would benefit from PrEP know about PrEP. Uh, along the way, we're trying to reduce the stigma. I think there's a lot of stigma around PrEP. People assume a lot of things when someone asks about PrEP. So. Uh, first of all, we have to educate the community, take away the stigma, and make it easy to get. Someone should be able to walk into a clinic, talk to their provider, and walk out the door with a prescription for PrEP. And now with Ready, Set, PrEP, there should be very few people who can't access PrEP due to cost. If you are told by your provider you need PrEP, if you get a valid prescription, but you don't have prescription care, Prescription coverage for drugs, we have, we have a way to get you free PrEP. Uh, people in tribal clinics, IHS, urban, are at a big advantage because 
most of the time their labs are covered. So even though that prep could be free, it actually the lab cost can be a burden for a lot of folks, but it shouldn't be a burden for our folks who are qualified for Indian Health Service care. Uh, barriers do differ among different tribes. Some tribes are really proactive in getting the information about PrEP out or giving training to their medical care staff, uh, you know, putting posters up in waiting rooms. And some tribes, just because they have so many competing priorities, I think, just sometimes can't get everything as a top priority. So um, it causes a barrier. Uh, lack of knowledge is definitely a barrier, and we're working on that. Uh, we're coming up with a series of three videos in the next week or two that will be played on this closed circuit TV called Good Health TV, designed specifically for waiting rooms and American Indian Alaska Native healthcare facilities. And it's going to talk about PrEP, uh, HIV, PrEP, and stigma. So we hope that will help us really promote PrEP, specifically the Ready, Set, PrEP program. Thank you. Our next question is, earlier you referenced the Phoenix and Gallup clinics were successful in getting patients into care. Can you speak to the strategies that the Phoenix and Gallup clinics use to engage and retain patients? Sure. I think one of the first things that is they really made an effort to screen people for HIV and then to get them into care. They set up a center for HIV excellence at the Phoenix Indian Medical Center. At the Gallup Indian Medical Center, uh, one of our leaders in infectious disease, Dr. John Irulu, has always been very proactive in talking about HIV and not just screening, but really implementing comprehensive care programs. And I think one of the, at both clinics, Phoenix and Gallup, <clears throat> the idea of making this a very uh, uh, comprehensive effort to wrap around care, to get re people re uh, into care to referrals to things like housing, uh, employment, um, social services, substance use counseling, um, all those other things that are definitely are related to someone staying in their care program. But I think one of the other big things is using uh, our community health representative, CHR program, which is similar, some folks might know it as like a community health worker or related term as patient navigators, as folks that contact the patient. Did you understand what your doctor was prescribing today? Do you know how to take your medicine? I'm going to stop by in a week and see how you're doing, see if you have any side effects. You know, things like, simple things like counting their pills, like, hmm, you should only have six pills left. How come you have 10? You know, getting, why is it hard to take your medication? Uh, let's get you back to the clinic for an appointment. I'll call and make that appointment for you. Oh, you don't have transportation. Let me see if I can help arrange that transportation for you. So it's a lot of that navigating, I think, that really uh, gets them and keeps them in care and gets them to that undetectable viral load. But it's, it's definitely uh, a big thank you to those clinicians who are working in those two facilities who have the desire and the passion, and then the communities who follow suit and um, welcome that kind of interaction with the clinic, the community health workers, and the patients. Thanks. Yes, we have a question from Chelsea. How many IHS facilities have SSP available? And then a second question, what specifically is being done to ensure that ANAI people are accurately represented in data? So Chelsea, I don't know a specific number that have the safe syringe program available. We're working on that. There are more uh, tribally run programs that are instituting this, uh, but, some of our IHS facilities federally run. So when I say IHS, I really specifically mean those that are federally operated. And then um, we have tribal uh, facilities who really are run by that own local tribe or urban program that are not directly governed by or supervised by or regulated by the IHS. So I can't tell you how many are involved in SSP, but there are some. Um, what specifically is being done to ensure that AIN people are accurately represented in data? We're working very hard and we have been for 30 plus years with our tribal epicenters to work with county 
and state vital records offices. Uh, we continue to do that. We continue to build up our data systems within the Indian Health Service. Um, and then our Division of Epidemiology is working closely with the CDC to um, look at data, see what's missing, see how we can improve that data. So and you, the report I gave today was really because of our close partnership with CDC. Now, you've heard, you know, if we don't get good data in, we don't get good data out. So that's, that's one of our big hurdles, I think, in, in all areas, is making sure we get that good data, we collect it, and we, we let people know what that data is being used for. There's genuinely and understandably some fear around how data and why data is collected. So we need to keep working to help our communities understand the benefits of that data and the use of that data and uh, really importantly, our tribal communities need to be the ones who decide when, how, where, who in the data collection system. So it's their data, they need to be informed, they need to give their consent, but we're working hard to show them the benefits of that data. So it's definitely a big group effort. There's no one easy answer for that, but our tribal epi centers have been working on that and we continue to work closely with them. Thank you. Well, that will conclude our Q&A session for this lecture. We're just gonna launch the poll one more time to make sure you have the correct answers to those three questions. Just give us a moment to bring those questions back up. So for question one, the correct answer was true. For question two, the correct answer is C. And for question three, the correct answer is true. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this informative webinar. We appreciate our lecturer today, Rick Havercate from IHS, for shedding light on this very important issue that is the HIV epidemic in Indian country and the current federal initiative to combat that problem. You can find more information about our webinar series on our website, www.fda.gov slash health equity. We, are, we do have more webinars planned um, in the coming year. This is our last webinar for this year, calendar year 2020. And again, you can also follow us on Twitter at FDA Health Equity on Twitter. You can follow the FDA Facebook page as well. Thank you, Rick. Thank you to the FDA team and thank you to our audience. Take care.